Thank you for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to present here today. Uh, given the short time I have, I'll briefly highlight the work I did in grad school and the work I'm currently doing at Harvard. In my experience, taking a multidisciplinary approach often proves beneficial for research output. As you will see in the next few minutes, all the projects I'm involved in are highly multidisciplinary. I did my PhD in chemical biology with overlaps in microbiology and clinical work in, in and clinical work in infectious diseases. And my postdoctoral work was or my postdoctoral work sits at the interface of statistical and epidemiological genetics and global health. So I'll begin with my PhD work. Here's the 30 second overview of mycobacterium tuberculosis or MTB, the causative agent of tuberculosis. MTB is a rod-shaped rod bacteria covered with a thick waxy cell surface. This surface, often called the mycomembrane because it is composed of mycolic acids, is a highly hydrophobic environment and is particularly important for pathogenesis. As a result, studying the biochemistry of MTB cell surface is a rich area of research, including tool development uh, to study the mycomembrane. By the time I joined the Bertozzi group, several molecules had been developed to probe the mycomembrane using biorthogonal chemistry. Here, the idea is that we take a molecule that is a natural component of the mycomembrane, say a sugar or a lipid, we chemically modify it with a handle that, once inserted into the organism, will selectively interact with a complementary reporter molecule of your choice without disturbing the biological system. For instance, trehalose, a sugar component of the mycomembrane, can be decorated with an azi group and fed to an MTB. Once the, on the cell surface, the azide modified trehalose would selectively interact with a cyclooctane molecule attached to a fluorescent reporter in a biorthogonal reaction step. After washing away unreacted cyclooctane probes, the now fluorescently labeled cells are detected with a fluorescence microscope. This clever setup was useful for research purposes and indeed was already used to, cell, to, to probe cell surface molecular dynamics, and, but my eye moved towards direct application to the clinics, particularly in low resource settings. So I began the project with a simple task, build a similar system using a single dye and preferably with a single labeling step. We hypothesized that environment-sensitive probes would prove very useful for us. Uh, Sylvatochromic dyes, as the name suggests, are molecules that can change color based on the surrounding environment. Particularly, DMN have been shown to be non-fluorescent in aqueous solutions and highly fluorescent in hydrophobic solutions. We reason that the metabolic macrolation of DMN trihalose conjugates, DMN tree for short, and their subsequent integration into the hydrophobic mycomembrane would activate its fluorescence and enable the detection of MTB cells without the need to wash away on metabolized probe. So DMN tree molecules are converted to trihalose mycolates via enzymatic action. And this microlation and subsequent integration into the hydrophobic mycomembrane would lead to fluorescence. So after DMN tray synthesis and quality control assays to confirm DMN tray behaves like DMN, we decided to test it in bacteria. I followed a simple procedure. I grew Mycobacterium smegmatis, a biosafety level one model organism for MTB, and incubated the cells with DMN tray for about 30 minutes. Then I directly smeared the sample and immediately imaged. And here's what we saw in that very first experiment. Under GFP is the green fluorescence channel that shows you where DM entry is fluorescent. Mind you, DM entry is both in and all around the cells. Still, only the probes that were metabolized by the cells turned on fluorescence and were detectable by fluorescence microscopy. Using a similar protocol with a previously published dye, we tested a few strains that we knew had a mycomembrane. And as you can see for yourself, we were blinded by the fluorescence of unmetabolized dyes and we struggled to detect fluorescent bacteria. Because we knew this labeling relied on enzymatic action, we hypothesized that DM entry would only label metabolically active cells. So I modified my protocol a bit. I pre-treated the cells with TB drugs for a few hours, washed and then labeled with DM entry and imaged. If you look at the fluorescence under the DMN channel, 
we observed no detectable labeling of drug killed samples. But what if we had a drug resistant strain? Isoniazid, the molecule shown here on the right, is a prodrug that requires activation by Cat G. So we hypothesized that a Cat G mutant strain will be resistant to the effect of isoniazid on DNA trait labeling. We incubated wild type and Cat G mutant cells with increasing amounts of isoniazid. Then we assessed the mean fluorescent intensity values with these samples after labeling with DMN tray, here represented by the dark solid bars. The gray bars represent control samples without DMN tray labeling. As you can see in this graph, with increasing dosage of isoniazid, we observed decreasing mean fluorescence intensity of DMN tray labeled wild type cells. But when we ran the same experiment with the Cat G mutant strain, the cells were unaffected by isoniazid treatment, suggesting that indeed DM entry is specific to metabolically active cells and ultimately could serve as a live dead reporter. It had been close to a century since the last time smear microscopy for TB diagnosis had been improved. Quite literally, the protocols and the dyes used today for TB smear testing in endemic countries are the same ones that were used nearly 100 years ago. Given the unique features of DMN tray, we were excited at the potential for using the probe as a diagnostic tool and possibly as a biomarker for, to report drug resistance early. This is important because the current TB smear test does not distinguish life from dead mycobacteria. So we set up collaborations with colleagues at Wits University and the University of Cape Town in South Africa to assess, one, whether DMN tray labels MTB in human samples, and two, whether DMN tray can report on drug susceptibility or resistance in the clinical context. After following uh, the standard procedure for sample collection and processing, the sputum samples or blood samples were subjected to DMN tray labeling and imaged. As you can see in the images, DMN tray labeled cells were readily detectable. We were particularly excited to see the images from TB blood samples because to my knowledge, this is the first time intact TB cells were visualized in blood samples, and we can now perform detailed morphological studies of disseminated TB cells found in the human bloodstream. We're currently working on the paper, and we hope to share our data on bioarchive soon. Now I'll switch gears and talk about my postdoc work. I elected to spend my postdoctoral fellowship in a statistical genetics unit because when I think of equity in, in biomedical research, it begins with genetics as it is the foundation for biological insight and therapeutic development. Unfortunately, the field of human genetics has a long and deeply troubled history. Even now, most genome-wide association studies, which are important from downstream uh, biological discoveries and proper clinical translation, are focused primarily on participants of uh, European ancestry. Professor Alicia Martin of Harvard MGH and the Broad Institute has demonstrated that despite the explosive growth in the number of individuals in GWAS papers, individuals of European ancestry comprise about 80% of GWAS, even though this same group only makes up about 16% of the world population. In the same paper, Alicia also showed that if we build disease risk prediction models based on Eurocentric GWAS and we compare prediction accuracy across continental ancestries, we observe increasingly worse prediction accuracies for population with uh, American, Asian, and African ancestry. C clearly, this reality severely limits the potential for equitable clinical translation for groups of non-European ancestry, which ultimately leads to health disparities. In partnership with Alicia and other colleagues at the Broad, we are building a platform to strengthen equitable risk prediction scores by First, assessing environmental factors associated with disease, since these may or may not be shared across populations. For instance, dietary consumption may differ by location or upbringing. Second, we'll combine exposure to these environmental factors with clinical predictors to build ancestry-specific risk scores. Oftentimes, community of colors have increased exposure to pollution, inadequate housing, or other social determinant of health, which may contribute to increased health risks. And third, we will validate these risk scores in target populations with global ancestries. We will give particularly attention uh, to the additive effects of genetic and environmental factors, which may significantly improve equitable prediction across ancestries. 
Ultimately, my independent research agenda will use chemical biology, biochemistry, statistical and epidemiological genetics tools to identify functionally relevant biomarkers and leverage their biology to develop equitable and clinically relevant applications. With that, I'd like to thank all of my collaborators and supporters and all of you for listening. And Erin, I'll hand it over to you now.